Ara Strattray was an anthropologist. He was active in the early 20th century. He was sent to the Gold Coast in around 1910, um, where he worked and, and ended up working at Achimoto College, which was the grand school of the Gold Coast at the time. Many of our presidents, Kwame Nkrumah, Rawlings, came through that school. Um, and he headed up the anthropology department there. Many of his students were research assistants. Um, and then in 1921, he started the anthropology department of Ashanti at SOAS. Um, in 1924, he did a West African pavilion at Wembley. And so what was interesting about Ratray was that he was mediating the image or the representation of Ghana and or what was then the Gold Coast and West Africa through these images, through his writings. You know, he, he wrote books like this one, which was called Akan Ashanti Folk Tales. Um, he learned Shri in order to translate them. He wrote this with the quite horrifying title, The Ashanti Proverbs, The Primitive Ethics of a Savage People. And that's what's interesting as well about going into the subjectivities of the people who collected these materials and brought them in is that he's not, it's, he's not black and white. He can write a book with a subtitle like that, The Primitive Ethics of a Savage People, and at the same time, you know, learn fluent Shui and spend, you know, years and years and years meticulously documenting this material. Um, and there's care in it. It's not done with the kind of, you know, there is, there are some incredibly racist depictions of, of, um, peoples in archives, these don't quite fit into that. So there's this kind of complexity of, of who this person was, um, how they depicted us at the time, and to kind of go into that and, and have it explained through these images. The other interesting thing was when I was doing my research degree um, into classical ontologies of, of um, the Achim people, the Akan people, I used Rattray quite a lot as a reference, as well as people like J.B. Denkwa. So what ha had happened was that the categorization of ourselves, both in text and in image, you know, was being mediated partly through a colonial administrator, um, which, is, which, is, which is a kind of tricky and interesting place to be. I mean, you'll see through some of these images, I find these images incredibly exciting. There are images of um, all kinds of classical architecture that doesn't exist anymore because, you know, the British raised them down. So you have that also that duality of um, something that's being destroyed and devalued on the, on the one hand and then kept and categorized and raised in value on the other hand. You know, we were told, for example, with a lot of these objects through the whole uh, mission, missionizing um, ex expeditions that, that happened, that are objects, that are um, rituals, that are ways of being, were of no value, that they were fetish, that they were voodoo, that they were negative. And yet then these objects were meticulously documented, carted off and brought into museums like this one and the British Museum where they were accrued value. So there's this kind of translation of value, which obviously is highly questionable ethically. You know, there is these, these depictions that we don't even necessarily have anymore, for example, of all the different types of architecture that you get. Um, you know, the Ashanti architecture, architecture of the north, you know, um, this kind of Islamic arch architecture of the Upper West and Upper East. You have sculptures, um, you know, these, these sculptures that you have to, to some extent in contemporary form. You know, this one of the ruler, the Ashanti king and his entourage. You have this form of sculpture, which I haven't really seen so much in Ghana nowadays. And then objects that I haven't necessarily seen in contemporary form, like these objects or this, you know, this sculpture, which is just really fascinating. One of the interesting things as well is that, um, you know, in the descriptions of the pictures in the archives, you know, he'll speak about different temples, um, that you know were in existence and so the fascinating thing as well is that just within within a hundred years um you know traditions that were very much in in living practice have been demonized because of the the kind of practice of colonial um moors and and that's a really interesting thing to trace and that can be directly traced and dated through the photography 
Um, another interesting thing, for example, that's um, noted in this in this archive, you know, there's this image of um, a stool, a silver stool that's being made. And in the description, it talks about this silver stool being consecrated for Princess Mary. Um, and, and there's quite a lovely description of it in the letter the Ashanti Queen Mother wrote to Queen Mary. And she writes, the silver stool of the Queen Mother of Mampong, she explains, it does not contain our soul as our golden stool does, but it contains all the love of us Queen Mothers and of our women. The spirit of this love, we have bound to the stool with silver fetters, which I think is quite beautiful. The interesting thing about the image and the description of it as well is that, you know, we, we hear often about the colonial relationship, first of all, from one side and of it being one particular thing. But this, this kind of speaks of a kind of mutual respect. It speaks of agency on our side. Um, it speaks of us as givers, um, not necessarily just of the colonized. And so there's things about these archives as well that just rewrite and recomplicate and give more pluralistic narratives. It's a fascinating archive to go into and relook at from my point of view, from a Ghanaian point of view, in terms of A, how you know, these writings and these images were meant to mediate the image of us to an outside world and then how it came back to mediate us back to ourselves. And also to put the writings and the photograph not just um, in context and in relativity with um, photographs and writings at the time done by Ghanaians or people of the Gold Coast, but also to look at them from a contemporary point of view. And what does that do in terms of informing us as Ghanaians about who we were and where we've come from and, and how we've come to be what we are today, but also of you know England in the same way. How did England um, you know, document, how did it come to understand itself by in relation to other people? So it's there's so much wealth in this um, in this archive and also, the other thing is looking at it from a classical Ghanaian ontology. Rattray, I think, was quite meticulous in his own categorization of these things. But, you know, if I go back to knowledge keepers now in Ghana, you know, what are they going to say to these photographs and what layers will they add once we have his, you know, categorizations and explanations against the categorizations by knowledge keepers and our own kind of categories of ontologies and of aesthetics.